Black Power Conrad Robert. What's going on this morning? You doing all right? <laughs> I said, I am it. I was wrong when I did it. I am it. Come on in the room, everybody. Come on in the room. It's time for the Revolutionary Book Club with Chief Dia. <laughs> Come on, y'all. Black Power, Karina. How you doing, sister? Y'all see, I got my New Orleans beats bouncing on this morning. Black Power Arrow, y'all like and share, like and share, please. Black Power Gigi. Black Power Naya. That I'd rather be. You in New Orleans? Oh, hell no, Robert. How the hell you in New Orleans and they tell me? You know I love New Orleans. What you doing in New Orleans? Huh? You organizing? <laughs> yes, thank you for sharing, Naya. Oh, okay. Please hashtag shared when y'all share the video, y'all. Let's get this video out. It's time for some political education on this Sunday morning. Looking for Mr. Right to find listen. Listen, they can make a New Orleans bounce song out of anything, okay? Any favorite song that you probably got, they probably already got a New Orleans bounce version of it. I'm telling you. <laughs> So we're going to give it till about 11.05. I'm going to let a few more people come into the room. Y'all, please like and share, like and share, like and share. Y'all know Facebook trying to block our reach, so we got to share as much as we can. But I'm so excited this morning, y'all. We reviewed, well, we read chapters one, two, one through three. So, um... Yeah, if you don't have the PDF of the autobiography, please hit up Comrade Robert or Comrade Gigi, and they can get that over to you so you can participate in the discussion as well. Come on, y'all. Let's get some more people in here. Share, share, share. Share to your own timeline. Share in groups. Share whatever you can, okay? It's not an accident, it's everything That maybe we were meant to be We're gonna get started at 11.05, y'all I'm gonna give it a little more time For some more people to come into the room Y'all doing okay? Comrade right Naya, are you still in, um You went back to Alabama, didn't you? Right, if I'm not mistaken I'm trying coffee, y'all. It's, it's actually not that bad. Huntsville, okay. It's really, it's, I've never really been a fan of coffee. Gazi put me on, cause I used to drink it a lot when I was younger, but I stopped. So whatever, but <laughs> I'm drinking some now, and I thought it was like, um, I thought it was like instant coffee. But when I look at the, the the packaging or whatever, it's like the actual coffee that you put into the filter. So it's like, I got a few coffee greens in my throat, but it's cool. It's all good. <laughs> I think it's doing the trick. <laughs> when are you coming back, comrade? Let's see what time it is. Okay, it's 11 Do y'all let me know? Do y'all like the music in the background? Cause I, I leave it playing a little bit. You know, I think it makes for a more festive time. But anyway, we're gonna go ahead and get started. And again, good morning, my beautiful African people. <laughs> And welcome to Black Hammer Presents The Revolutionary Book Club with your boy, Chief D. 
Via. I hope y'all doing okay today on this beautiful Sunday after, well, Sunday morning. <clears throat> I haven't been outside yet, but I'm looking out the window and it already looks hot. It's been hot as hell for like the past couple of days, like child. I ain't got time. <laughs> but anyway, welcome, 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 welcome. And as you guys know, today we will be reviewing chapters one through three of Asada, an autobiography, which is the autobiography of our dear sister Asada Shakura, who is now living in Cuba. I want to spend a, a sin, <laughs> a special shout out to my comrade Gigi, who got this for me. It's, this book, it just looks revolutionary, right? It is so nice, and Asada is beautiful on the cover, isn't she? Y'all like that? <laughs> but again, I just want to remind you, if you're tuning in for the first time, or if not, um, please hit up Comrade Robert for the uh, PDF version of the book um, so you can follow along with us. And, you know, it's free. You don't got to pay for it. <laughs> But before I go any further, I want to let you all know that the book club does serve as a fundraiser for our organization, Black Hammer. So you can support by going to blackhammer.org, um, click the donation tab. You can donate through that or you can donate through the uh, our cash app. At uh, it's, I don't think you have to put the dollar sign, but it's BH Book Club for cash app and this morning um we have a goal to raise 25 dollars. as you all know we are really trying to professionalize my little set here um it's this wonderful circle light that has a phone holder tripod all of that in one combo and we want to do that so this morning i saw uh gg post the links in here um so you can look in the comments but again we got a goal to raise $25 today. I know we can do it. Um, again, you can go to blackhammer.org, donate through there. You can go through uh, Cash App again, and that's BH Book Club, which stands for Black Hammer Book Club, okay? And I also have another very special announcement this evening at 6 o'clock. Black Hammer presents pre hashtag Protect Our Girls, an interview. <clears throat> Excuse me, uh, with Sister Marcy Th Thrasher and Brother Anthony Valentine, um, who is the parents of these two beautiful black girls. Um, as you know, uh, Black Hammer, we're kicking off another campaign again, which is entitled Hashtag Protect Our Girls. And this campaign revolves around two beautiful, two beautiful black children. Um, I believe the ages of seven and eight. Please, Comrade Muhammadu, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, at this moment, they are being subjected to um, abuse from their stepfather, this man who molested them. Um, and now he has been able to, they're, the two girls, they're now with their biological mom and the stepdad has been molesting them. And through these backward ass courts, he has been granted supervised, unsupervised, Un, let me make, I'm going to say that again. Unsupervised visitation with these two beautiful black children. And they have been through therapy. You know, all of these different things that have been set up by the courts, you know, who don't have the interest of black people at, don't have the interest of black people at heart. Never have, never will. Um, you know, and now they have to be around this monster. And so tonight at 6 p.m., um, going live from the Black Camera Facebook page, I'm going to be doing an interview with them. Um, they have just been the most courageous, um, you know, parents that I have ever, well, not that I've ever seen, but, you know, that I've, you know, experienced working with. Sister Marcy is on the committee for the hashtag Protect Our, Girl, um, Protect Our Girls campaign. Um, and, you know, they're raising funds to uh, pay for a lawyer that they found to keep on re rot uh, retainer, excuse me, um, because one of the previous lawyers that they had actually stole their rota retainer. But we're going to go into all of the details tonight. Again, that's 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and we're going to go live from 
the Black Hammer Facebook page. So y'all make sure y'all turn tune in for that, okay? Can I get some hashtag shares? I know we got nine people in here, but I want to get some more. So let's try to get up the viewership because this is very important, y'all. We want to get this political education out to everybody this morning. So um, please has put hashtag shared in the comments when you share it, okay? So while y'all doing that, I'm going to tell y'all how this whole process is going to work. This is how the Revolutionary Book Club works, okay? So how we're going to do it is, uh, of course, we're going to go three chapters at, at a time. You know, as we said um, last week and as we're going to do today, we're going to review chapters one through three. And with each chapter... I'll provide, you know, like a brief summary, um, go through different points that I, you know, read in the chapter that really stood out to me. And then we have hashtag read that back. OK, that's read that back. <laughs> and what we do, we hashtag read that back. I'm going to read my favorite part of the chapter and then, you know, discuss that. And then I want you to put in the comments your favorite part of the chapter with hashtag read that back and you got to spell that d-a-t okay not that read that back <laughs> and then we're going to discuss it okay so um let's go ahead and get into it gg please um again make sure that you post those donation links y'all we want to raise 25 dollars this morning so y'all know where to go so we can do this thing okay so let's get started now I will say I didn't want to read the four words mainly first because um, one of the four words for the book is written by Angela Davis. And y'all know we don't <laughs> we don't feature Angela Davis. OK, um, at one point in time, she may have been this, you know, this revolutionary force or whatever. But not too long ago, this sister was talking about voting for Hillary Clinton. And y'all know we don't fuck with no Hillary Clinton. OK. And <laughs> another portion of the foreword was written by Brother Lennox Hines, um, who was the director of Black Lawyers. Um, matter of fact, let me tell y'all. He was the uh, director. Hold on, let me find it. He was the director for the National Conference of Black Lawyers, which was an organization that has been called on to defend political activist in the black community since its founding in 1968. And actually his portion of the forward was the most politically sound to me. So, um, yeah. And, um, yeah, when we hear about, to be honest, when we hear about, you know, Asada Shakur, or Shakur, excuse me, um, me, myself, before I came into political life, it was always just a question of who is this woman? You know, I'm always hearing people talk about her, you know, um, and the main thing that I would hear people say is that she escaped to Cuba. She's living in Cuba now. And, um, you know, just become, coming into political life is when I began to do my research and find out who this sister was. And I mean, in high school, um, I, you know, we would read some of her poetry, but you know how the colonial school system is. They're not going to put you on that, uh, on the stuff that we need to be on. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> but um, what was so interesting to me to find out is that, you know, everybody focuses on, you know, this event you know, with the state troopers that took place on May 2nd in 1973. But what a lot of people um, may not be privy to is the fact that prior to Asada Shakur being charged with the murder of um, the state trooper, that, you know, the government, the United States government has all had already began, you know, putting charging her with all of these different various crimes. And she has also been and still is a victim of COINTELPRO, and she was listed in this document. And so what I want to do is read at this moment a portion of um, a portion of the uh, forward that was written by Brother Lennox because he speaks about, you know, just the, uh, you know, how none of it. This whole situation, like how it all came about, like the different charges and things of that nature, don't even make sense, like chronologically or whatever. Like it doesn't, it just doesn't make sense. So I'm going to read this portion real quick. And it says, 
Um, as the chart that follows this essay shows, on May 2nd, 1973, when the shooting on the New Jersey Turnpike occurred, Asada was wanted, quote unquote, wanted for all of these different crimes. The irony is that not one of the charges led to a conviction. When she was apprehended, shot down on the New Jersey Turnpike, leading to her only conviction. Now, listen, this the, the shooting on May 2nd led to her only conviction. But prior to all of this, they have been charging her with all of these different things. And I'm going to get to that in just a moment. Um, yeah, so leading to her only conviction, she should have enjoyed the presumption of innocence that the Fifth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution is supposed to grant to any of us when accused. But we understand that that's not how it works. So um, just to let you guys know that who Asada was with on the night of May 2nd, 1973, she was with her comrades. Um, and I'm, I'm probably going to butcher this. Y'all know I'm country as hell. So Leave me alone. Um, so we have Soon Diata Akoli and Zayed Malik Shakur was traveling with her. And, you know, um, it was just a it, it was a whole mess. So just so we can review the, the events of that night, I'm going to read a little further. So, you know, we have an understanding of the basis of where we're working from. So on May 2nd, 1973, Asada, Sun, Sundiati Akoli, and Zayed Malik Shakur were traveling south on the New Jersey Turnpike in a white Pontiac. They were stopped by New Jersey State Trooper James Harper for reasons consistent with the FBI Quantel Pro uh, guidelines, which directed that activists be arrested for minor traffic violations. So that means if you have been identified as somebody who was working with the Black Liberation um, Movement, if they stopped you for a traffic uh, violation, even a minor traffic violation, that was grounds for them to arrest you. So what they were trying to do at that moment was arrest Asada and her comrades based on a minor traffic violation or whatever you want to call it. So they said how they were able to, you know, how the pigs were able to sum it up was that they were trying to stop them for some faulty tail light or something of that nature. So Harper's testimony, however, leaves open the suggestion that the Pontiac was simply a target. Harper testified that when he first saw the Pontiac, he was two miles north of the Turnpike Administration Building, headquarters for the trooper. He followed the car for two miles until it was close to the administration building before he pulled it over because, and I quote, the lighting, not the tail light, but just the lighting in general, uh, was better and there was more security. The Pontiac was traveling at a normal speed in the center lane. Hopper first passed it in the left lane, observed the driver, and quote-unquote made a mental note of his description. He then moved to the right lane and let the Pontiac pass him, at which time he made a mental note of the sex race and sex and race of the passengers. When he approached the Pontiac in the left lane, he motioned Santi, um, Sundiata to pull over and call the administration building for assistance. When Trooper Robert Palinchar was directed to assist Hopper, he commented on the radio, and I quote, meet you at the pass, partner, and sped to the administration building at 120 miles per hour. Trooper Werner Foster was also went, also went to assist in the stop, for which Hopper testified only a summons would have been issued. <sighs> okay, so that's pretty much... You know, how they were able to charge Sister uh, Asada. And as I said earlier, like, this was the only conviction that she got, you know, in terms of everything that they were trying to charge her for. And what I want to do now is go to um, this timeline that has been created in the book. And I'm not sure. Well, I'm sure it's listed in the uh, the free PDF file. But just real quickly, I want to go over the different charges that they were trying to uh trying to charge Sister Asada with. So on April 5th, 1971, she was charged with armed robbery at Hilton Hotel, New York City. That, uh, uh, whatchamacallit, those charges were dismissed. In August 23rd, 1971, she was charged with bank robbery, but she got an acquittal. 
September 1st, 1972. Um, she was charged with bank robbery again, but that was with a hung jury and acquittal. Then on December 28th, 1972, kidnap of a drug dealer, acquittal. January 2nd, 1973, murder of drug dealer, dismissed. January 23rd, 1973, attempted murder of poli policeman, um, ambush, dismissed. May 2nd, 1973, murder of state trooper, new, um, murder of state troopers, excuse me, Jer New Jersey Turnpike, change of venue. And, um, hold on, I want to backtrack just a second, um, because <sighs> white power has never, ever been able to change the structure of how they go after, you know, black revolutionaries. And, you know, as we've seen what they did with Huey P. Newton, what they did with Fred, Fred Hampton, what they did with uh, Bobby Hutton is, you know, they violate, you know, these these leaders, these pillars within our community. And then after this violation, they assassinate the character of these revolutionaries who fought for black people. And, you know, in turn, you already have these white nationalists who um, are only more emboldened by the different stuff that is put out by the media in turn, which is controlled by the U.S. government, which is controlled by the FBI, which is controlled by the CIA. And, you know, what, we, what we're seeing with this is the same, with Sister Asada, is the same thing that we've seen done with so many different, you know, revolutionaries within our time. And not even to say that they only do it with regular, well, with uh, just revolutionaries. We see them do it with regular African people, working class, black, poor, African, indigenous people all the time. We're talking about, you know, a situation when I was in St. Petersburg. And I want to give a shout out to Sister Kunde, whose daughter, Dominique, was murdered by the Pinellas County um, police officers. They murdered this beautiful black child and then went on this in her uh, two of her friends, Ashanti and Lanaya, 16, Dominique was 16, Lanaya and Ashanti were only 15. And after they were murdered by the pigs, they just went on this whole smear campaign, you know, putting uh, mug shots of these beautiful girls in the newspaper and just dragging all of this stuff, you know, all of this just trash about them in the media. First to desensitize, you know, the African community, the black community to be like, you make you feel some type of way like, damn, they was doing all of that shit. Maybe that's what they deserve. And again, emboldening, you know, these white nationalists saying, yeah, that's exactly what these niggas deserve, okay? And we see that this is what they tried to do with uh, Comrade Asada. And I just want to find this portion real quick. Um, when they, uh, because like I said, prior to her being convicted, you were tried and convicted with the murder of the, uh, the state troopers on the New Jersey Turnpike. They had put up all of these trumped up charges and they, uh, where's the portion at? Let's see, let's see, let's see. Mm. This is also the good to read with a highlight of y'all. And I'm so critical that I don't have one because I should have had one. Alrighty, so I'm going to stop right here. It says, it's important to remember that Asada Shakira's decision to join the Black Panther Party occurred soon after J. Edgar Hoover ordered the uh, 41 FBI offices to intensify their efforts to expose, disrupt, misdirect, discredit, and otherwise neutralize black nationalist organizations and their leaders. So this that had already put a target on um, Sister Asada Shakur's uh, back. Um, Asada could no longer go home. She was on the FBI's most wanted list, accused of being armed, of being a bank robber, and subsequently of being a kidnapper and a murderer. A photographer, a, a photograph, excuse me, alleged to be Asada Shakur taken at the scene of a bank robbery in August 1971 appeared in a full page, a full page advertisement in the New York Daily News on July 10th, 1972. It was a duplicate of a poster placed in every bank 
in city, I mean, in, uh, excuse me, it was placed in every bank in the city and state of New York in post offices and sub stations, subway stations, y'all. The advertisement announcing wanted for bank robbery $10,000 reward was printed above four photographs. One of them, the picture of a woman allegedly taken during the 1971 bank robbery. Beneath the picture, in bold capital letters, was the name Joanne Deborah Chesimard, which is a Sada Shakur's uh, slave name. Um, during her trial for this bank robbery, which ended in acquittal, a jury found that it was not a picture of a Sada. The photograph had been released by the FBI in the U.S. Attorney's Office to New York Clearinghouse uh, Association, a bank's association, which placed the ad in the posters. Even after Asada had been acquitted of this bank robbery in January 1976, another advertisement offering the same reward for an unapprehended bank robbers appeared in the Daily News in March 1976. Now check this out. This time, however, the photograph was a recognizable mugshot of Asada with the word apprehended across her face. This poster appeared two months after her acquittal on August 1971, on the August 1971 charge, excuse me, two years after her acquittal on September 1972 bank robbery charge. And while no bank robbery charges were outstanding against her, so there it is. We already know um, what the U.S. government was trying to do. And I'm going to continue to say the U.S. government because, you know, we've been fed this narrative that the media is this own, its own freestanding thing. It's in, uninfluenced by, you know, politics and all of this other type of stuff like that when that's a goddamn lie. And this is evident of that, evidence of that. So... I just wanted to lay that context before we got into, you know, the chapters and everything else of that nature. Um, so let's take a second to read some of these comments. We have uh, Comrade Daniel who says, an officer in East Athens ran over a young guy no older than us in a, uh, in, hold on. An officer in East Athens ran over a young guy no older than us in the collective last August. He was awarded $250,000 by the city commission's council a month later, and his case barely went to child trial. The victim was struck by the pig. The victim who was struck by the pig was a lumping brother on the block, comrades. Yep. Yep, 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 yep. We have Comrade Nye who says, no, they refer to her as a fugitive that needs to be extradited to complete her sen sentence. Excuse me. They refer to her by her government name. Yes. So now let's get into the chapter. So chapter one, for me, what stood out the most when reading it um, was just the 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 clarity of how Sister Asada was able to just recall the events of what happened on May 2nd. And just reading it, it, it brought chills to my body. And I don't know how to describe it, but it was just like, you know, for her to be able to remember and sum up everything that happened to her, you know, like in my mind, I would think that you know, you probably wouldn't be able to recall, you know, the details of what's happening to you. Like, she was shot and, you know, beaten by the pigs during this event. And just how she writes about it, it was just like... I don't know how to describe it. It was just like, really like, damn, how was she able to recall so many, you know, so much of what happened? And I just want to read like maybe the, uh, the first few paragraphs of chapter one, maybe, you know, just to give you an understanding of, you know, like my experience when reading it. And it says, there were lights and sirens. Zed was dead. And I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing his name wrong. Uh, my mind knew that Zed was dead. The air was like cold glass. Huge bubbles rose and burst. Each one felt like an explosion in my chest. My mouth felt, well, excuse me, my mouth tasted like blood and dirt. 
The car spun around me and then something like sleep overtook me. In the background, I could hear what sounded like gunfire, but I was fading and dreaming. Suddenly, the door flew open and I felt myself being dragged out onto the pavement, pushed and punched, a foot upside my head, a kick in the stomach. Pigs were everywhere. One had a gun to my head. Which way did he go? They were shouting. Bitch, you better open your goddamn mouth or I'll blow your goddamn head off. I nodded my head across the highway. I was sure that nobody had gone that way. A few of the cops were off and running. Like, how, how do you describe, like, the air was like cold glass? And then to have to, you know, internalize at that very moment that one of your comrades is actually dead. I don't know. That was just so like, <laughs> uh, I don't know. It again, like literally, y'all, when reading it, it just ran. It made my, it made the hair stand up on the back of my neck. It was just, it was, it was crazy. So, you know, pretty much through chapter one, um, she describes her, you know, her experience of what happened that night on May second. And then also, you know, how they, what happens to her in the hospital. And of course, you already know without a shadow of a doubt, they abused her. She speaks about how, um, you know, there's different pigs that come in on different shifts and they beat on her, you know, they poke her, they prod her, and you know, they do all of these different things to her. I mean, she was at one point when she first got into the uh into the hospital they didn't even know if she was they didn't even know if she was going to live or die and at the same time they were trying to fingerprint her they were asking her all of these different questions you know trying to interrogate her and all of these different things it was even to a point i think she uh says in here that one of the uh one of the doctors you know under the uh under the leadership of the pigs was sticking out. She doesn't, she isn't able to identify what the sub, the substance was that he had on his fingers, but he was literally poking her in her eyes, making her eyes burn. I want to assume that it may have been Mesa or something like that. But what was so disgusting and just like, just, uh, so it was, just, I mean, and that's not, what I'm about to read, that's not even the, the tip of the iceberg of what has been done to African people, you know, under colonialism and imperialism here in America. She speaks about, um, I, I'm going to just read it. So the stretcher is moving again. Where the hell, are they, where are the hell are they taking me? Again, the light is changing. And although my eyes are closed, I can feel the difference. It feels like I'm in the dark. I can't take it any longer and I look. The room is dark, but there is some light. My eyes slowly adjust. There's something lying next to me. I can see an outline, something in plastic. Something my mind slowly realizes that is a man in a plastic bag. And that man is Zayed. My body stiffens, my mind spins. So they take Asada and place her in a room next to her dead comrade, Zayed. Can you just, you know, imagine just, it's sick, it's sick, it's sick. But what's so indicative of Asada's resistance to all of this is, you know, just this ordinary regular statement that she makes, but it's just so profound when she says, the night crawls along, nurses, doctors, and troopers. I'm still scared, but I am just as angry and evil as I am scared. How powerful is that? I am still scared, but I am just as angry and evil as I am scared. That was just... That was so powerful for me for her to be in this situation 
where I'm pretty sure at that point, she probably felt like she wasn't even going to be able to survive, but she was still fighting. She still had that anger about her. She still had that that sense of, you know, resistance. And that was just so, that was just so powerful to me. So, um, yeah. And so she speaks about, you know, just the different tactic, tactics and abuse, um, you know, that was used by the pigs to try to break her. And then um, she speaks about being the charges, that so they have her in this they first they left they had her in a regular um in a regular um hospital bed in a hospital bedroom or whatever but the pigs make the decision to move her to this like suite and only because excuse me they had more uh, security measures they know that she would be secu secluded so they would be able to abuse her in whichever way that they wanted and not have to worry about um would not have to worry about, you know, anybody coming in, you know, and messing with her. And so um, how they were able to get and she still didn't break or whatever, but they were able to get through her to through a sister, a black nurse that was, um, you know, trying to get her name and everything like that. And being that Asada, being that Asada thought that, you know, the sister, and it probably wasn't even on behalf of the sister, because I'm, I'm telling you, like, how she describes how they have the pigs just posted everywhere in the hospital, there was no way that that sister was going to get out of there with any information that Asada had given her. So at one point, Asada did give her her name and a number to call to let her family know that she was in the hospital, because at this point, nobody knew where Asada was. So once she passed this note along to the sister, of course the pigs got it and they just turned up on her all over again. So my portion of uh, chapter one, hashtag read that back, is when um, Sister Sada goes over the charges that they give her. And I'm not going to even stunt like I think I had to read this portion at least twice. And it's, I had to read it twice because, you know, white people are so goddamn stupid. And they use all of this unnecessary language. And of course, you know, it's to keep us in a state where we don't really understand what the fuck is going on. And they just put in all of these different unnecessary words. And that's how it was. So... They didn't even take her to court to formally charge her. They came, they brought the judge into her hospital room and read the charges to her. And this is a lot. If you were able to read, as you can see, it was a lot of charges. And I, I can't read through all of them, but I'm going to read some of the language just so you can see how stupid this shit sounds. We are here today to serve complaints upon you for the matters arising on the shooting of May 2nd of 1973. I will read to you the complaints, leave copies with you of the charges that will be pending against you. The judge will then advise you on the arraignment of such rights you may have. You are charged under complaint number 119977 by Detective Toronto, New Jersey State Police, who says on the 2nd of May 1973, within the confines of the township of East Brunswick, Brunswick County of Middlesex, that you unlawfully and illegally resisted an, a lawful arrest, excuse me, being made by the New Jersey State Trooper James Hopper by distar discharging a dangerous pistol and wounding the said James Hopper and fleeing the scene of the incident, all in violation of NJS 2A semicolon 85-1. What the fuck is all of that? <laughs> like what 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 is all of that? Like what what is that? Let's see, what was another uh charge that I had to read like twice or so? Okay, this one right here. 
You are charged with S-1199-82 by State Police Sergeant Louis Toronto that on the second day of May 1973 in the township of East Brun Brunswick, County of Middlesex, you unlawfully and illegally possessed on your person, under your custody and control, an illegal weapon to wit one Browning 9mm uh, automatic pistol, one Browning automatic point. 380 caliber. I don't know how to read guns, y'all. So, <laughs> give me. Um, 1.38 caliber Llama automatic pistol, serial number 24831, uh, all without having obtained any necessary permit for the carrying of same in violation of NJS 2A semicolon 151-41. Nonsense. Not nonsense. I don't and if you've been able to read, it was just like what what the fuck what the fuck was that? So another part of chapter one that um stood out to me uh was when Sister Asada was finally able to see her uh her family. And which what was so touching to me is the interaction that she was able to have with her mom. And she says, and I quote, I'm proud of you, she says. The words spin around me, weaving a warm blanket of love. I am so happy I can hardly contain myself. My mother is proud of me. She loves me and is proud of me. And that part of chapter one was so touching to me because you know, when we as black people make the decision to come into organization, to come into political life, nine times out of 10, you know, we become isolated from our families, you know, which we can sum up that is, you know, just a consequence of being, you know, colonized and oppressed because, I mean, our people have been completely brainwashed. And so much to an extent that if you speak anything, you know, in terms of black power or, you know, the revolution or, you know, wanting to organize within a community, they look at you crazy. And, you know, just personally, I experienced that, you know, with my family, as I'm sure many of my comrades, you know, do as well. And... Just for her mother to, you know, come into that room, knowing everything that her daughter is facing at that moment, and just to express how proud she was of Asada, that was just so extremely touching to me. And, um, you know, I just, it just really made me think to myself that, well, I hope, you know, one day that, you know, my parents can be proud of you know, my decision to become a revolutionary and fight for the freedom of our people. So that's chapter one. So let's see. Hashtag read that back. I'm going to go into the comments. I think I saw a couple of people put in, um, you know, the comments. What were their favorite parts of uh, chapter one? So let's see here. I think we have... Uh, Okay, let's start with Conrad Valencia, who says, hashtag, read that back. What stood out to me was the fact that she refused to talk to the, to the pigs, even though they beat her mercilessly, even with life-threatening injuries. Also, the fact that they were withholding proper medical treatment and hoping that she would die. Yes, Sister Valencia. And when, they, when the ambulance arrived at the... Uh, at the uh at the crime scene or whatever the turnpike when all of this had popped off they actually kept her at the the crime scene for like a number of hours and just kept checking into the back of the ambulance hoping that she would just eventually die but she didn't but um yes that was <laughs> The the discipline that it takes to be able to, you know, 
not break under all of the abuse that this, you know, Sister Asada Shakur describes in chapter one. I mean, it's just, excuse me, it's, it's astounding. They just, they did so many horrible things to her. Hashtag read that back. Let's see who else has, okay, we have Sister Valencia again who says, she asked for a lawyer and they told her she didn't need one because they just knew they were going to roll, you know, roll all over her. We have uh, Brother Shamit, and I'm sorry, Brother Shamit, if I'm pronouncing that wrong. I'm, I hope I'm not. Who says, I like the part where the black security guard gave her the black power salute. Yes, yes. That was, a, I like that part too. Let's see. We have Comrade Daniel Mapp. Who says, my favorite part is when she said her mom was proud of her. Yes, hashtag read that back. Yes. And we also have a uh, comrade Gigi who says, hashtag read that back. My family doesn't support this lifestyle because they're scared of what could happen to me. If I ever were to hear those words from my family, it would mean everything to me. Asada is so powerful and brave. And, yeah, I unite with that comrade, Gigi, because a lot of times, you know, when me and my mom have our different uh, spats or whatever, <laughs> I wouldn't call it necessarily spats, but, you know, just our debates over, you know, what I do as a revolutionary, that's one of her, um, you know, one of her main concerns as well. You know, one of the number one things that she brings up Um is my uh my safety or whatever and I don't at this point it's just like when you when you stay in the work for so long and then you just become to internalize yourself that you know at this point my life doesn't even belong to me anymore it belongs to the people and just, you know, nurturing that, you know, nurturing that notion within yourself to understand that this is what you have decided to do. I mean, at, you know, it's just like, I don't want to say like having an epiphany, but it becomes like, it becomes your life and you, you can't, you then can't separate it, you know, from anything else. Uh, we have comrade... Uh, Nye who says, um, hashtag read that back. When the pigs would change shifts, some would salute like Nazis, yes, and talk about what the world would be like if Hitler had won. Yeah. <laughs> so before we move on to chapter two, again, I just want to remind you all that the uh, Dove Revolutionary Book Club, again, serves as a fundraiser for Black Hammer. So again, please donate what you can by going to blackhammer.org, uh, or you can donate through Cash App at BH Book Club, which stands for Black Hammer Book Club. As I said earlier within the show, we have a goal this morning to raise $25. So if I can get in the comments, let me know how much you want to donate. I'll give you a shout out. And I also want to remind you guys again about our uh, giveaway that we're going to do. And you can get an autographed uh copy of the autobiography of Asada Shakur that will be signed by myself. I'm sorry it's not going to be signed by Sister Asada, but you know, I'm I'm pretty I'm pretty cool. <laughs> so, um in order to uh be eligible to get the giveaway, you have to have um attended at least 3 of the Revolutionary Book Club live broadcast. You've had to donate like um, you know, we take donations, you know, the minimum $5 or whatever you can. And you have had to participate in the uh in the discussion here on Facebook. And you will get a signed copy of the autobiography of Sasha Shakur. Okay? So Let's move on to chapter two. And being like I admitted earlier in the show, I didn't really know too much about Asada Shakur, but when you read chapter two, you do find out that this sister was raised, you know, by the petty bourgeoisie. She grew up petty bourgeoisie. And um, 
what was so interesting to me was not only interesting, but actually kind of funny is her being able to, you know, talk about her childhood and then sum it up for what it was at the same time. You know, just being able to identify the class differences that she saw, you know, within, you know, her own family and with herself, you know, and how she came, um, you know, how she came to terms with that. And she spoke about how she would spend the summers down south in Wilmington, North Carolina with her grandparents because she lived in, um, she was born in New York. Excuse me. I don't know what's going on, my allergies are acting up or something. <laughs> but she grew up in New York, but she would spend the summers with her uh with her grandparents down south in Wilmington. And what what was uh what I liked about um chapter two, even understanding that her uh, uh even understanding that you know her grandparents were on the wrong side of the question. Um, just how her grandma and her grandfather just gave her a sense of pride, you know, of being black, you know, just for, I'll read, for example, how she says, who's better than you? Nobody. Who? Nobody. Get that head up. Yes. Yes, who? Yes, grandmommy. I want that head held high, and I don't want you taking no mess from anybody. You understand? Yes, grandmommy. Don't let no, don't let, um, excuse me, don't let me hear about anybody walking over my grandbaby. No, grandmommy. I don't want nobody taking advantage of you. You hear? Yes, I hear you. Yes, who? Yes, grandmommy. All of my family tried to, tried to instill in me a sense of personal dignity. But my grandmother and my grandfather were really fanatic about it. Over and over, they would tell me, you're as good as anyone else. Don't let anybody tell you that they're better than you. My grandparents strictly forbade me to say, yes, ma'am, and yes, sir, or to look down at my shoes or make subservient gestures when talking to white people. You look them in the eye when you talk to them, I was told, and speak up like you've got some sense. I was told to speak in a loud, clear voice and to hold my head up high or risk having my grandparents knock it off my shoulders. Right on. <laughs> and I just want to give a thank you to Conrad Naya who donated $10 just now. Black Power, Conrad. Thank you for your donation. Uh, so that's uh, what... I'm horrible at math, but we only got fifteen more dollars to raise this morning, so y'all, I know we can do it. <laughs> so, um, another portion of this chapter of chapter two, which was uh really good to me, um, was again how she was able to identify the class question, and I'm gonna read this portion as well as she says. But a lot of times, for my grandparents, pride and dignity were hooked up to things like position and money, the petty boo. For them, being just as good as white people meant having what white people had. They would tell me to go to school and study so that I could have a nice house and nice clothes and a nice car. And I quote, white people don't want us to see don't want to see us with nothing, they would tell me. That's why you've got to got that's why you got to get your education so that you can be somebody and have something in life. Becoming somebody in life just didn't mean too much to me. I wanted to feel happy, to feel good. My awareness of class differences in the black community came at an early age. Although my grandmother taught me more about being proud and strong than anyone I know, she had a lot of Booker T. Washington, pull yourself up by the bootstraps, talented 10th ideas. She had worked hard and had made a decent living as a peace worker in a factory, but she had other ideas for me. She was determined that I would become part of Wilmington's talented tent, the privileged class, part of the so-called so black bourgeoisie. Yeah. Um, and I just want to say, you know, that as black people, you know, we don't, we're not born you know, wanting to aspire to be the black petty bourgeoisie. 
And I think a lot of us, well, not I think, I know that black people are introduced to this idea that, you know, they can achieve some type of semblance to the white woman class. And I believe, you know, that that notion has been, you know, forced upon us since forever. And Black Power, Comrade Gigi donated $5. So that means we only got $10 to go, but you can donate <laughs> as much as you want. But, um, you know, we aren't born with these ideas. Like, you know, these ideas are forced upon us. And, you know, that's when it becomes our responsibility, you know, as revolutionaries to, you know, at least, in my mind, make some type of an attempt to win, you know, you know, family members. And, of course, you know, everybody can't be one to the revolution. But to me, in my mind, how I would, you know, always see it is that, you know, you have to, um, oh, only the host can pin the donation links. I had no idea. Let me, let me put that in real quick. I'm sorry, y'all. Okay, so now going forward, I know that's what I have to do. Okay, let me just put this in here real quick, y'all. But let me, are y'all enjoying the book club so far? I know I'm talking a lot. <laughs> Let's see. Book club. And... But you know what? I think I did know that, but I kind of forgot. <laughs> All right. I'm sorry, y'all. I'm coming. Okay. Now, can I pin this? Pin comment. Okay, there we go. All right, but, um... Yeah, let's see. What was my hashtag read that back portion of chapter two? Oh, well, well, real quick, one uh one uh thing that stood out to me also um that I didn't know was the part when she spoke about um her family's last name, which was Freeman on her uh on her uh mother's side. And it's the portion that she speaks about it. Um, she says, the popular name for the beach was Bop Beach, although my grandparents insisted on calling it Freeman's Beach. Throughout my childhood, the name Freeman had no particular significance. It was a name like any other name. It wasn't until I was grown and began to read black history that I discovered the significance of the name. After slavery, many black people refused to use the last names of their masters. They called themselves freemen instead. The name was also used by Africans who were freed before slavery was quote-unquote officially abolished. But it was mainly after the abolition of chattel slavery that many black people changed their names to freemen. After learning this, I saw my ancestors in a new light. I never, um, I never knew that, you know, about the name Freeman because I mean, you know, as a slave, you take the last name of your, uh, you know, of your slave master. But that was something, um, yeah, that I didn't know. And I, you know, I enjoyed reading that. So my hashtag read that back part of, uh, chapter two was, um, Sister, oh, we got another donation, y'all, from Sister Catherine. Thank you so much, Sister Catherine, for your donation. Um, the part when she speaks about, you know, us as black people being brainwashed and us not even knowing about it. And I think she speaks to um, a portion in the book of when she's in school as a child and just, you know, the self-hatred um, 
you know, that her and the other black children her age at that time, you know, just displayed. And it kind of took me back to, you know, what I, if, I'm pretty sure it takes us all back to our childhood when we would just, you know, tease each other and the, uh, you know, the different insults that we would use as children. And just to understand that even that, you know, is shaped politically within ourselves by white power, you know, this internalized self-hatred. And she says, most of our fights started over petty disputes like stepped on shoes, flying spitballs, and the contested ownership of pens and pencils. But behind our fights, self-hatred was clearly visual, visible, excuse me. Nappy head, nappy head, I catch your ass, you're going to be dead. You think you black and ugly now, I'm going to beat you till you purple. You just another nigga to me. I'm going to show you what I'll do with niggas like you. You better shut up, you big blubber lips. We would call each other jungle bunnies and bush boogies. We would talk about each other's ugly big lips and flat noses. We would call each other pickaninnies and nappy haired so-and-sos. Act your age, not your color, we would tell each other. You're going to thank me when I'm through with you. I'm going to beat you so bad, I'm going to beat the black off of you. Black made insults worse. When you called somebody a bastard, that was bad. But when you called somebody a black bastard, now that was terrible. In fact, when I was growing up, being black, period, being called black, excuse me, period, was grounds for fighting. Who you calling black, we would say. We would had never heard the words black is beautiful. And the idea had never occurred to most of us. And, a, a, you know, what also um, comes to mind when reading this portion of uh, chapter two. Um, and I believe Conrad Ghazi um, previously um, and even now just speaks about, you know, the slander of the black working class. And just how, you know, just understanding that we are the most slandered, um, you know, sector, you know, on this planet. And just how we can, you know, how that has been, um, how we internalize it. And then we begin to use it as a weapon against each other. So much so that... You know, even when you're speaking with family members and, you know, you might say it as, you know, something comical, but even at that moment, we don't really have a grasp of, you know, what we're participating in when we say, um, you better not be outside for too long. You're going to get too, you're going to get black you know, or uh, just being around your grandparents when they would be like, you know, I ain't going out in that sun. I'm not trying to get black. And just like all of these different things that, you know, has been placed into us by black power. And then, you know, like I said, you know, we in turn weaponize it against each other. And just to hear um, Sister Asada sum that up, it was um, it was it was a great read, and another portion I want to read real quickly, when she says, "We had been completely brainwashed and we didn't even know it. We accepted white value systems and white standards of beauty, and at times we accept the white man's views of ourselves. We had never been exposed to any other point of view or any other standard of beauty." From when I was a tot, I can remember black people saying, niggas ain't shit. You know how lazy niggas are. Give a nigga an inch and he'll take a mile. Everybody knew what niggas like to do after they eat, sleep. Everybody knew that niggas couldn't be on time. That's why there's CPT, colored people's time. Niggas don't take care of nothing. Niggas don't stick together. The list could go on and on. To varying degrees, we accepted these statements as true, and to varying degrees, we each made them true within ourselves because we believed them. So powerful. So powerful. 
So now it's time for you to tell me what was your favorite part of chapter two. Let's see if we have any hashtag read that back for chapter two. Anybody have a portion of chapter two that they liked? Let's see. I don't see any at that at this moment. But yeah, that was pretty much um, chapter two uh, for me. And the portions that, you know, uh, really spoke to me within that chapter. But, um, you know, as a lot, as I'm beginning to see that, you know, some of our favorite uh, uh, revolutionaries, they grew up, you know, Teddy Boo. And again, um, you know, what really, uh, like I said, was comical and funny to me was how... It was like you have Asada just looking back at her younger self and then just like, you know, completely reading the hell out of her own self. And I think um, <laughs> I've been confronted with that because, you know, black. Well, uh, Facebook has that feature, you know, the memories feature where you can go back, you know, like years and see stuff that you posted like years ago. And sometimes I look back and then I'm just like. What the fuck was I on? <laughs> like, versus then and now, it's just like, dear, what what was what was what was really good? <laughs> so before we uh, move on to uh, chapter three, again, I just want to give y'all a reminder about um, tonight's interview at 6 p.m. Black Hammer presents hashtag protect our girls an interview with sister Marcy Thrasher and brother Anthony um, Valentine. Um, and just so you guys know, brother Anthony and uh, sister Marcy, they're engaged. So, excuse me. Um, I'm going to be in, uh, interviewing this beautiful couple to speak about, you know, the hashtag protect our girls campaign. And this is going to be, you know, like your formal introduction to these two, um, beautiful African parents. And, um, you know, we're going to be speaking about the case, you know, what they've been, um, you know, what they've had to experience up until this point. And, um, again, it's also going to serve as a fundraiser because they're raising money. The campaign is raising money. Um, to uh, get this uh, new retainer for another uh, lawyer that they um, have identified. So um, again, I just want y'all, everybody to please tune in. Um, tell a friend to tell a friend to tell a friend and just make sure that you're there. And, um, you know, it's just continuing in the path that Black Hammer has created, you know, to, well, not necessarily created, but you know, just holding ourselves accountable to what we told, what we tell the people that we're going to do. And, you know, um, one of those things is being that we will protect our black children. And this campaign is just another, you know, um, manifestation of that same promise that we've made as members of Black Hammer. So just make sure that you uh, make sure that you're able to tune in for that. So I think we I got some hashtag read that back. And Comrade Gigi says, my favorite part was when her grandparents would tell her nobody is better than her to get her to keep get her head up. I don't know why this why the comment isn't explaining. Okay, there it goes. Um to get her head up and don't let nobody walk all over her. Yes. That reminds me very much of my grandmother Peaches. <laughs> Um, and yes, comrade Karina, she does talk a, a lot about, um, segregation and, um, let's see. Shamit says, there is a saying that goes something like the middle class is educated enough to know what's wrong with the system, but too comfortable to do anything about it. That part, <laughs> that part. So... Moving on to uh, chapter three, we uh, find Sister uh, Asada. This is when she's moved to um, the Middlesex Workhouse. And she speaks about um, her, you know, her experience being there 
And um, it's this workhouse where I believe like um, these uh, these women, they do like different various things or whatever. Because I know um, she speaks about being given like a maid uniform or something like that. But even when she first got there, they confined her to this room that she was not allowed to leave. Like I believe um, she speaks about how there's first this bar, like you have the regular jail bar. And then there's like this solid steel door with just like a cutout peephole that she can barely even see out of. And um, so she speaks about that. And she also speaks about, um, you know, just the different relationships that she, you know, um, that she was able to build with the women within the uh, within the workhouse. And they call it workhouse, but we understand, you know, it's it's prison. It's a concentration camp no other uh you know it's no other way around that and you know they just she also um talks about how they you know they treat her during this process because remember she has been shot and at this point um she still is a bullet in her chest and she they broke her uh what did she say she broke her uh dang it starts with the c but I know it has something to do with her, uh, it has something to do with her, um, shoulder. And then at this point, they also tell her that she's going to be paralyzed in her right arm. But we come to find out later on that that isn't true. Um, so she speaks about, you know, how her first month there, she writes. There we go. Thank you, Conrad, Valencia. And I'm not even sure if I can pronounce that, but it's the... Clavicle, clavicle. I would just leave that right there. <laughs> but um, yeah, she just speaks about her first month there and how she was, you know, just writing. How they wouldn't let her read the newspaper for none of the women, you know, as she speaks to at that point were able to read like newspapers. And I think like one of the pigs even told her that they don't want her to read because the newspaper is going to be like some type of fire hazard or something else of that nature. But um, immediately I was able to identify my read that back portion of chapter three. And I'm going to read that now. And it talks it's the portion of the chapter where she speaks about Evelyn who's her aunt and also her lawyer um and she speaks about her aunt being able to bring into her a tape recorder because again at this even up to this point with her being locked in the prison uh thank you comrade shaman <laughs> um at this point nobody even knows that she's locked up so she makes the determination that she has to let people know, you know, what's going on. And so she records this tape and it's called To My People. And she uh, released it. And I think it was broadcast on. She doesn't name the radio stations, but she does let us know that, was, that it was broadcast on radio stations. And she released it on July 4th, 1973. And I just think that is so powerful, you know, um, just understanding the climate that America is in at that moment and just understanding even now in present time with uh, what July 4th is supposed to symbolize, you know, for America or whatever. But, you know, just in a day and time, you know, where the the black liberation movement of the 60s had just pretty much been, you know, like wiped out. You know, we saw our revolutionary leaders being murdered and, you know, just the movement, you know, being assassinated by the U.S. government, by the FBI, CIA. And for her to be in her current predicament, you know, and was still able to release, you know, such a powerful statement. And... I want, it's kind of, it's long, but I think it's worth reading and I want to read it. Um, and then also that she released it on my birthday. <laughs> I think that was cool too, you know, whatever. But, um, so I'm going to read it and it says, Black brothers, black sisters, 
I want you to know that I love you and I hope that somewhere in your hearts you have love for me. And that part was just, I, that was powerful to me as well because, you know, at this moment, we understand that the FBI, the U.S. government, the media is just slandering the hell out of, you know, Sister Asada's character and, you know, painting her to be this horrible person. And, you know, it's it's heart wrenching, you know, to you know, to think that at this point she's been isolated. There's no one that she's been able to speak to into the outside world and just to have the the idea that, you know, her people, us as black people, have lost love for her, you know, due to, you know, what the government is doing to assassinate her character. Um she goes on to say, my name is Asada Shakur and I'm a revolutionary, a black revolutionary. By that, I mean that I have declared war on all forces that have raped our women, castrated our men and kept our babies empty bellied. I have declared war on the rich who prosper on our poverty, the politicians who lie to us with smiling faces and all the mindless, heartless robots who protect them in their property. I am a black revolutionary, and as such, I am a victim of all that wrath, hatred, and slander that America is capable of. Like all other black revolutionaries, America is trying to lynch me. I am a black revolutionary woman, and because of this, I have been charged with and accused of every alleged crime in which a woman has been believed to be to have participated. Excuse me. The alleged crimes in which only men were supposedly involved, I have been accused of planning. They have plastered pictures alleged to be me in post offices, airports, hotels, police cars, subways, banks, televisions, and newspapers. They have offered over $50,000 in rewards for my capture, and they have issued orders to shoot on sight and to shoot to kill. I am a black revolutionary, and by definition, that makes me a part of the Black Liberation Army. The pigs have used their newspapers and TVs to paint the Black Liberation to paint the Black Liberation Army as vicious, brutal, mad dog criminals. They have called us gangsters and gun moles, and have compared us to such characters as John Dillinger and Ma Barker. It should be clear, it must be clear to anyone who can see, think, or hear that we are the victims. The victims and not the criminals. It should also be clear to us by now who the real criminals are. Nixon and his crime partners have murdered hundreds of third world brothers and sisters in Vietnam, Cambodia, Mozambique, Angola, and South Africa. As proved by Watergate, the top law enforcement officials in this country are a lying bunch of criminals. The president, two attorney generals, the head of the FBI, the head of the CIA, and half the White House staff have been implicated in the Watergate, in, uh, excuse me, implicated in the Watergate, Watergate crimes. They call us murderers, but we did not murder over 250 unarmed black women and children or wound thousands of others in the riots they provoked during the 60s. The rulers of this country have always considered their property more important than our lives. They call us murderers, but we were not responsible for the 28 brother inmates and nine hostages murdered at Antica. Attica, excuse me. They call us murderers, but we are not. But we did not murder and wound over thirty unarmed black students at Jackson State, a Southern state, either. They call us murderers, but we did not murder Martin Luther King Jr., Emmett Till, Medgar Evers, Malcolm X, George Jackson, Nat Turner, James Ch Cheney, excuse me, and countless others. We did not murder by. Sh we did not murder by shooting in the back. 16-year-old Rita Lloyd, 11-year-old Ricky Bodden, or 10-year-old Clifford Glover. They call us murderers, but we do not control or enforce a system of racism and oppression that systematically murders black and third world people. Although black people supposedly comprise about 15% of the total American population, at least 60% of murder victims are black. For every pig that is killed in the so-called line of duty, there are at least 50 black people murdered by the police. Black life expectancy is much lower than white and they do their best to kill us before we are even born. 
were burned alive in fire trap uh, tenements. Our brothers and sisters OD daily on heroin and methadone. Our babies die from, he uh, from lead poisoning. Millions of black people have died as a result of indecent medical care. This is murder. And they got all the gall to call us murderers. They call us kidnappers, yet brother Clark Squire was kidnapped on April 2nd, 1969 from our black community and held on $1 million ransom in the New York Panther 21 conspiracy case. He was acquitted on May 13, 1971, along with all the others of the 156 counts of conspiracy by a jury that took less than two hours to deliberate. Brother Squire was innocent. Yet he was kidnapped from his community and uh, family. Over two years of his life was stolen, but they call us kidnappers. We did not kidnap the thousands of brothers and sisters held captive in America's concentration camps. 90% of the prison population in this country are black and third world people who can afford neither uh, bail nor lawyers. They call us thieves and bandits. They say we steal. But it was not we who stole millions of black people from the continent of Africa. We were robbed of our language, of our gods, of our culture, and of our human dignity, dignity, of our labor, and of our lives. They call us thieves, yet it is not we who rip off billions of dollars every year through tax evasion, illegal price fixing, embezzlement, consumer fraud, bribes, kickbacks, and swindles. They call us bandits, yet every time most black people pick up our paychecks, we are being robbed. Every time we walk into a store in our neighborhood, we are being held up. And every time we pay our rent, the landlord sticks a gun in our ribs. They call us thieves, but we did not rob and murder millions of Indians by ripping off their homeland, then calling ourselves pioneers. They call us bandits, but it is not we robbing Africa, Asia, and Latin America of their natural resources and freedom while the people who live there are sick and starving. The rulers of this country and their flunkies have committed some of the most brutal, vicious crimes in history. They are the bandits. They are the murderers. And they should be treated as such. These maniacs are not fit to judge me, Clark, or any other black person on trial in America. Black people should and inevitably must determine our destinies. Every revolution in history, yeah, every revolution in history has been accomplished by actions, although words are necessary. We must create shields that protect us and spears that penetrate our enemies. Black people must learn how to struggle by struggling. We must learn by our mistakes. I want to apologize to you, my black brothers and sisters, for being on the New Jersey Turnpike. I should have known better. The Turnpike is a checkpoint where black people are stopped, searched, harassed, and assaulted. Revolutionaries must never be in too much of a hurry or make careless decisions. He who runs when the sun is sleeping will stumble many times. Every time a black freedom fighter is murdered or captured, the pigs try to create the impression that they have squashed the movement, destroyed our forces, and put, the black revolution, and put down the black revolution. The pigs also try to give the impression that five or ten guerrillas are responsible for every revolutionary action carried out in America. That is nonsense. That is absurd. Black revolutionaries do not drop from the moon. We are in this, listen, this part, <laughs> this part is so powerful. Uh, let's see, where was I? Uh, we are created by our conditions, shaped by our oppression. We are being manufactured in groves in the ghetto streets, places like Attica, San Quentin, Bedford Hills, Leavenworth, and Sing Sing. They are turning out thousands of us. Many jobless black veterans and welfare mothers are joining our ranks. Brothers and sisters from all walks of lives who are tired of suffering passively and make up the Black Liberation Army. There is and will always be, until every black man, woman, and child is free, a Black Liberation Army. The main function of the Black Liberation Army at this time is to, is to create good examples, to struggle for black freedom, and to prepare for the future. We must defend ourselves and let no one disrespect us. We must gain our liberation by any means necessary. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. We must love each other and support each other. 
we have nothing to lose but our chains. In the spirit of Ron O'Connor, Carter, excuse me, William Christmas, Mark Clark, Mark Essex, Frank Heavy Fields, Woody Chinga, Alu, Alu, Bala Green, <laughs> Fred Hampton, Little Bobby Hutton, George Jackson, Jonathan Jackson, James McLean, Harold Russell, Zaid Malik Shakur, Anthony Kamu, uh, Alubala White. We must fight on. That 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 uh that tape was. Just imagine, like, um, you know, being in that time and then hearing that broadcast from Sister, you know, Asada. Um, I just, you know, I would imagine that it just had to be so uh, re-energizing re for, you know, revolutionary brothers and sisters, you know, back then at that time. And just the fact that, you know... As I said earlier, like white power, white imperialism, capitalism is so stupid. They are so stupid. And as she sums up, you know, here in this portion that they are creating the conditions for revolutionaries to rise up. You know, and it's just. <laughs> yeah, um, let's see. So that was my hashtag read that back um, portion of chapter three. Let's see if we have any in the uh the comments. Let's see. Okay, so Sister Valencia says, hashtag read that back. The tape was my favorite part of chapter three. Everything she said in the tape is still relevant today. Yes. Uh, Conrad Knight says, you and Asada share a birthday month. Ah! <laughs> Excuse me. Brother uh, Schmidt says, I have killed, but I'm not a killer. A good line from a book I'm reading now. Yes. Um, we have Christopher, who says, I watched the footage on YouTube with Farrakhan in the Orange Puppet mentions. Let's see. I don't know why is this. Um, let me doing that. This book is a great read. It holds heavy weight. I've shared it with family. Thanks for the Revolutionary Book Club invite. Right on, brother. I'm so glad you're enjoying it. All right. So, um... The last portion of uh, chapter three that stood out to me. Well, no, I have two more. <laughs> two more um, is when uh, Sister Asada speaks about um, the suicides, the so-called suicide. Well, no, she speaks about the murders of black prisoners in these concentration camps. And, you know, just like I said, like, White power never changes its, uh, you know, its tactics. And just like how we saw with Sister uh, Sandra Bland, who it was reported that committed suicide in prison, when we know without a shadow of a doubt that she was murdered. Um, she speaks about, um, you know, how... Uh, how you, how these uh you know these black prisoners are found murdered in their cells and she says in prison it is not at all uncommon to find a prisoner hanged or burned to death in his cell no matter how suspicious the circumstances these deaths are always ruled suicides there are usually black inmates considered to be a threat to the orderly running of the prison. They are usually among the most politically aware and socially conscious inmates in the prison. And that was definitely our sister, uh, Sandra Bland. So, um, and lastly, um, she speaks about this sister that she met <laughs> by the name of Eva. And she says that, you know, they got along famously. And Eva was a part of this uh, riot that started with uh, Sister Asada when, you know, they had these... At this point, they haven't, they let, they've let her leave out of her cell just to go short distances or whatever. But every time they would come to Sister Asada's uh, jail cell, she would just walk out and just walk out into the open because, again, she's been isolated for so long. And I mean, at this point, you know, the pigs will try to get her to come back in. But at one point, um, when she's being served her lunch, she just takes her tray and goes sits. Um, she sits amongst the other women within the um, prison. 
And so the guards try to contain her, but she says once they reach for her, like chairs, trays, cups, everything just stopped flying everywhere. <laughs> and, you know, they speak about, um, she speaks about the relationship that she's built with Sister Eva. But after the ride is over, they move Eva to this, uh, to this men mental institution because they say that she has some types, some type of, um, mental disability. Um, but the only mental disability that I can identify is colonialism. So, um, but Sister Sada writes this, uh, poem that I just think is so, uh, so badass. And I just want to read that. Um, she says, uh, and just hold on. I want to break down the description of how she, um, you know, how she describes, uh, Sister Eva. And she says that Sister Eva is a big sister. She says, I think, um, 300 pounds. And she has her head shaved, like, like faded, like shaved down. And she just comments on how beautiful this sister is and how she clearly sees that Eva has no type of notion, no type of desire to try to uh, hold herself to these white standards of beauty. And I think the poem that she writes is just so touching. And she says, Rhinoceros woman, who nobody wants and everybody's used. They say you're crazy, cause you not crazy enough to kneel when told to kneel. Hey, big woman, with scars on the head and scars on the heart that never seem to heal. I saw your light and it was shining. You gave them love, they gave you shit. You gave them you, they gave you Hollywood. They purr at you, cause you know how to war and back it up with realness. Ron is worst woman, big mama in a little world. <laughs> you closed your eyes and neon spun inside your head cause it was dark outside. You read your Bible, but God never came. Your daddy would have loved you, but what would the neighbors say? They hate your mama because you expose their madness and their cruelty. They can see in your eyes a thousand nightmares that they have made come true. Black woman, bad woman. Wear your bigness on your chest like a badge because you done earned it. Strong woman, Amazon. Wear your scars like jewelry because they were bought with blood. They call you mad and almost had you believe in that shit. They called you ugly and you hid yourself behind yourself and wallowed in their shame. Rhinoceros woman, the world is blind and the slight of mine and cannot see how beautiful you are. I saw your light and it was shining. Wonderful, 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 wonderful. Um, yeah, so that pretty much sums up chapter three for me. And um, she also speaks about uh, she also speaks about uh, going to trial and how she's actually moved to. Um, so she starts off in the Middlesex woman's uh, workhouse, a.k.a. prison. And then she speaks about how she's moved to the uh, she's moved to the male um, jail there so you have the workhouse and then you have the middle sex workhouse and then you have the middle sex jail and she was moved to the basement she talks about being moved to the basement and they say that they put her there only because where her court hearing is supposed to take place you know just the convenience of it being in the same um in the same place um, but she says in September, I was moved from the workhouse and entombed in the basement of the Middlesex jail, Middlesex County jail, allegedly because of the jail's proximity to the Middlesex County courthouse where the New Jersey trial was scheduled to begin on October 1st. I was the first and last woman ever, ever in prison there. It was all, it was all, it has always been, excuse me, a male jail. So um, she talks about just the different taxes that they use because, as she says, it's leading up to the trial. So they would leave the lights on um, in her uh, in her cell and would not turn them off. And she just speaks about how blinding the light was. And 
here it is. She's supposed to be preparing to go to trial. But how can anybody, you know, have any type of peace of mind when you have these pigs that are doing, you know, doing all of this horrible stuff to keep her awake and just jumble her mind? Um, and she speaks about how, um, you know, the jury, um, have, how they have to go through different juries because, of course, the jury is full of white nationalists. And they, she said, I think she says they have like, they had about like maybe three or four black people on the jury. But again, you know, none of these brothers and sisters were able to participate because of them trying to survive, you know, meaning that they had to work or take care of their children and just didn't have time to participate in a uh, in a jury trial because they knew that it was going to be drawn out. And uh, they, she even speaks about how um, one of, uh, I think she said it's a jury, a juror who's only 20 years old. And at this point, they're questioning the people who are going to participate on the jury, you know, just to see if they are qualified to be on the jury. And it's this 20 um, year old that she speaks about that basically comes out and says that, you know, everybody on the jury is saying that she is guilty that she needs to be prosecuted and all of this other kind of stuff like that. So the judge is then forced to, you know, go a different route or whatever. And so they go to Morris County, which is a county full of white nationalists. And I think one of her lawyers tells her that there's only like maybe 5% black people in this county where they're pulling the, uh, pulling the jury from. Um, and she just speaks about, um, you know, how she was being, uh, you know, so frantic about what was happening, you know, during the proceedings. Because here it is, you have this African sister, as many of us who don't know much about the courts, you know, anything about, much about the laws and anything else of that nation. I can understand where her, you know, her franticness, if that's a word, you know, um, was coming about. But um yeah, and she also I'm and I meant to mention this earlier, but she also speaks about being uh reunited with brother um Sun Viata and how that, you know, was really, you know, um, you know, relaxing for her and just giving her the idea well not the idea, but just the reassurance that um she wasn't alone. So um yeah, so that concludes chapter three and um let me see. I'm looking at my notes. Y'all know I got to take notes. <laughs> but yeah, that's chapter three uh, for me. And um, if we have anybody else who has any um, parts of chapter three that they enjoyed, I'm just shifting through the comments right now. And if not, um, that is going to conclude today's uh, Revolutionary Book Club. And I just want to uh, thank everybody who tuned in. And just to let you guys know that we will be back on uh, next Sunday, same time, same place. And um, we went to what is 1230 now. Um, so I think what we'll do is go from 11 to 12. 30. I think that would be a good enough time to foster um, a good enough conversation. But um, I just really want to uh, really want to thank everybody for tuning in this morning. And I hope you guys are enjoying the book club so far. I know I am. And um, <laughs> I just hope you guys return um, next week to read with me. As you can see, um, this book is going to be a page turner and I'm very excited to um get to uh get through the book and um again I just want to remind everybody to please if you don't have um the PDF yet please request that uh from comrades Robert who and Gigi who are working in the comment section they can send you over the uh send you over the um Send you over the links for the P, uh, free PDF so you can catch up to where we're at now. So next week, we're going to do chapters five, well, four, five, and six. So as um, I laid out how we're going to do it, y'all, we have that hashtag read that back. Um, so please, you know, as you're reading, 
um, each chapter, you know, highlight the portions of the chapter that you like or, you know, speak to you and we can discuss it. You know, we want to have, um, be able to foster a discussion where we're just going back and forth because I don't really, um, like just reading to y'all. I want y'all to participate, um, you know, in the conversation as well too. So, um, let's see. Um, again, just really want to remind y'all about the interview we have today with Sister Marcy and her fiance, uh, uh, Brother Anthony. And again, that's going to be at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And we're going to be going live right here from the um, Black Hammer Facebook page. And I also want to thank um, everybody who was able to donate um, today. Um, and again, please, uh, you can go to blackhammer.org and make a contribution. You can go to, um, Cash App and it's BH, uh, Book Club, which is Black Hammer Book Club. You can donate through there. Um, and I want to say that we want to purchase the equipment, the lighting, um, the lighting tripod within maybe the next, uh, three weeks. And so, um, we're going to work to raise those resources. So when you come, I can look prettier than what I look right now. <laughs> and then we could just have, um, you know, we could just have a good ass time, you know, doing political education and, you know, just really chopping it up and, um, you know, yeah. So I want y'all to meet me back here, um, next week, Sunday. And if you haven't become a member of Black Hammer, Become a member of Black Hammer. Next time, I'm a, I'll, I'll provide next time the um, the call-in number for our weekly meetings that we have every Tuesday. Um, so you can come and participate in that as well, just so you can get an introduction introduction of Black Hammer and, you know, what we do as an organization. Because we need you, my brother. We need you, my sister, okay? So I want y'all to enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Enjoy the rest of your, uh, the rest of your, uh, your Sunday. Thank you so much, Conrad and I. Uh, I feel, listen, I I have, I put my notes and stuff together, but I just can't help but feel like, um, I be doing my, uh, I feel like I be rambling. <laughs> I really do feel like I'll be rambling, but um, as long as it's coherent and y'all can understand <laughs> what I'm saying, I think we're going to be good, okay? Conrad Histopher says, I will be back. I was in the wrong time zone this week. Okay, well, we we look forward to having you back, brother. So um, I'll see y'all at 6 o'clock for the interview, so make sure y'all tune into that, okay? Black power! <laughs>